very much everybody for for joining got lots of people joining now so what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll get started uh just to introduce my name is neil langridge i'm the marketing director at e92 cloud um so we're hosting this event the secret life of the criminal underground we've got some fantastic speakers i'm just going to run through the, the the format and just the timings in terms of uh, you all know how everything is running so first of all uh, just to introduce the, the speakers today so we have Jeff White, he's a very well-known cybersecurity uh, journalist, he's going to be our keynote, uh, he's going to be starting off. Uh, then we have uh, Maya Horowitz, who's the Director of Threat Intelligence and Research at Checkpoint, uh, Pascal Heenans, who's the Director of Threat Intelligence at Radware, and then Rob Otto, who's the Field CTO at Ping Identity. So uh, we'll be hearing from them, uh, kind of starting off with Jeff, followed by Maya, Pascal, and then Rob. So in terms of the format, They'll be talking, uh, giving some uh, kind of short presentations. Then at the end, we're going to have a panel Q&A uh, where they'll get a chance to have a, a bit more of a roundtable discussion, a bit of a conversation, and then ask, answer some of your questions. Um, in terms of kind of questions, we're going to have some polls running. So I'm just going to start the first one up here. It's obviously great to be able to uh, get, some, uh, get a, a view from uh, you uh, in terms of uh, what you're all seeing. It's great to get some feedback. So just starting one now. Just about whether you've seen a rise in cybercrime, um, you know, within your within your organisation, working with your customers or your partners, kind of during the, the current situation, the pandemic that we've been facing. Uh, great to get your feedback there. We'll be starting a second poll just at the end of Jeff's session, um, and then we'll just have a brief summary at the end. In terms of questions, there is a, a question box for, for the Q and A. You can ask them. Um, the, the the speakers will uh, possibly, you know, try and look at them as we go along. But most of the questions will collate um, and address them to the whole panel, um, you know, at the end of the session. Uh, finally, um, uh, thank you very much for attending. Obviously, we're uh, you know delighted to be uh, giving a free copy of uh, Jeff's book. What we'll do in terms of that, um, obviously, as you registered, you provided your email address. We will uh, email everybody um, and request the, the the address that you'd like it sent to. Obviously, from a GDPR perspective, we'll uh, only use that information just uh, purely in terms of the address to send you the book, and then it will be. Uh, deleted and removed from the system. So um, that's it from me. Um, just give you another another minute or so. Anybody else who just wants to, to fill in uh, the question on the poll, um, that'd be great so we can get as much feedback as possible on that. And then we can obviously address it a little bit, uh, you know, at the end in terms of the, the Q&A. Uh, give just a little bit more on that. Um, that's great. Lots of, lots of people have filled that in. So thank you very much. So um, obviously, you're you know here to talk, uh, listen to the, the main speakers, and not listen to me uh, talking. So I'm just going to end that poll. Gonna just uh, stop the, the share now. So um, thanks very much. I'm going to hand over to Jeff White. Good stuff. Thanks, Neil, uh, and thanks for having me, and thanks, uh, folks, for attending. Um, and as Neil said, you get a free copy of my book, Crime.com, which is fantastic. You're already twenty quid up which is a great way to start a Thursday morning. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope, uh, I hope you, you, you like reading it. I certainly enjoyed, um, uh, I certainly enjoyed writing it. Um, well, most of the time I enjoyed writing it. It's a really odd experience writing a book. And I had this sort of moment of terror, you know, as it was coming up, as the publication was coming out, thinking, well, does anybody really like tech security, cyber crime, is that still really on the agenda? There was so much else going on, what with Brexit uh, and what with obviously coronavirus. Um, and then obviously just today, we've seen a sort of plethora of news stories, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about in a bit and come on to later. We've had the Twitter thing. We've got lots of stuff around Russian interference in elections, which again, there's a whole chapter in the book about that as well. Um, I chatted to my wife about this. I sort of said, you know, I'm a bit worried that, you know, cybersecurity has dripped off the agenda and, you know, nobody's really going to care. And she just looked at me and went, when was that film Hackers released? And I was like, hmm. 1995? She said, yeah, I, I, think, I think cybercrime's a long-term thing. I think you'll be okay. But it does raise, it did raise the question of where to actually start off writing the book. Like, where do you start the story of cybercrime? What, 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 what stage do you actually start that at? And so for me, I decided that I was going to try and start it um, with the love bug virus, which those of you who are as long as in the tooth as I am will remember this was 2000. It's one of the first, it's certainly the first global virus really that made a really big impact it's about 45 million machines around the world that it compromised and it was a worm virus as well so it spread and spread and replicated um, and what was really interesting about it was that th the way it worked was it, it was it, it mailed itself copies of itself to um, all the recipients in your outlook address book so basically if you think about it 
if each person who receives it mails it to 50 people and each of those 50 people mails it to 50 people, it only takes six or seven hops to infect the entire world, <laughs> which I, I wasn't quite sure whether those maths were real. So I had to do it several times on the calculator and it's true. It's basically six hops is enough to infect everybody in the world, presuming of course they all have computers and they're all running Microsoft Outlook. But I, th I found that really interesting because one of the things that people did in the wake of that love bug virus was to turn their email servers off for a time because their email servers were getting inundated with more and more messages. And this is really interesting echo down the line in terms of how we've dealt with coronavirus. One of the big impacts of coronavirus has been partly the virus itself, which has killed very many people, but also our efforts as a society to decouple ourselves from each other and to undo those links and to isolate ourselves has caused a lot of the economic damage. That's exactly the same sort of thing that, that worm viruses like love bug did. You know, your efforts to stop getting infected cost you as much even as getting infected might do itself. Um, so I wanted to start the book there. Um, firstly, because for me, it was the big kind of outbreak. And secondly, it's a slight confession I need to make to you. It, the love bug virus was my first failed attempt at becoming a technology journalist. Um, when the love bug virus happened and became big news, I sent a sort of fairly badly researched article to The Guardian. I was working for an internet company at the time, and I sent a piece in um, that I sort of cobbled together. And I got, this, I got a response from The Guardian, which uh, I still remember to this day, which was, well, you know, thanks for the article, we're not gonna publish it. And by the way, sending us an email with the title, love, I love you, during the middle of a pandemic with the same name, probably not the best way to pitch a piece. So no, I didn't get a job at The Guardian at that point. And I've had to fight my way back into journalism ever since. Um, one of the things I wanted to do was try and work out who is behind the love bug virus. Um, if you, you'll read your copy of the book, you'll find out the whole backstory behind that. But I ended up going to the Philippines, going around a whole bunch of markets trying to find this guy. Um, and eventually did manage to track him down, spoiler alert. Um, the chap who caused that love bug virus, who unleashed it back in 2000, it's a really interesting guy. He was a student at the time, he was in his tw early 20s. And he, he wrote this in order to try and get free internet access. He was try effectively trying to steal people's internet access passwords. So he created this virus and he unleashed it around the world. And he'd done this before. He'd done this on a much smaller scale in the Philippines. He created a virus that would steal people's internet access passwords. But at some stage he decided he was going to unleash it across the world. It's gonna become a global virus. And he made it a worm virus so that he had no control over where it would spread. This thing would just propagate and propagate. Now at that stage, he's faced with a really interesting problem. How do you convince people around the world, no matter what country they're in, no matter where they are, no matter who they are, how do you convince everybody in the world to click on an email? What's the one thing that unites everybody in the world, the one thing we all want and that we all crave? And it is, of course, love. That's the one thing everybody in the world wants. And so the guy who created this virus, an elder Gutzman, I don't think he was fully conscious of this. I think it was inadvertent, but he suddenly hit upon the greatest lure that you could ever come up with. Everybody wants love. So he christened his virus the love bug and it arrived in the form of a love letter. And of course, a love letter from somebody, a hidden admirer, a secret admirer, you're gonna click on the love letter and see who it is who's got a secret crush on you. And sure enough, as soon as you did that, you got infected, the virus would send itself to other recipients and so on. What I find remarkable about that is what an elder Gutzman cracked all those years ago, 20 years ago now, almost to the day, the, the anniversary was in May, the 4th of May, um, what he cracked was that it's not about the code. The code he assembled was pretty good. I mean, he's a fairly smart coder, but it was all out there already. The worm element was out there already. The self-replicating virus stuff was out there already. The way it hacked into passwords, it, it was all there already. It was a good cobble together of existing computer virus technology. But what Onel de Gutzman put on top of it was the people element. He understood, perhaps not consciously, as I say, but he innately understood that in order to get this to work and work around the world, you need to hack people. And the best hackers, the good hackers, are the people who hack people. And again, writing the book has been a really interesting process because time and time again, those big hacks, the mega hacks, the ones that make the news, if you trace them right back to the beginning, the initial attack vector is people. It's the phishing email. It's distressing how many of these huge hacks rely on that one simple trick. If you look at it, Bangladesh Bank hacked for 81 million, allegedly by the North Koreans, phishing email. Sony Pictures Entertainment, again, North Korea, probably the Lazarus Group, phishing email. The Democratic National Committee hacked, again, according to the FBI, by Russian uh, state agents, 
Again, it was phishing emails that got them in. It's distressing to me that in the 20 years of evolution since the love bug, we're still kind of getting the grips and getting a learned lesson of the fact that it's the people who are the weakest link in the chain. And what's interesting is, you know, we've had breaking news today um, uh, about Twitter, of course, being compromised. Some really interesting aspects to that. Uh, one of the things I find fascinating is that the, the methodology of how they actually got in. I've been reading the Vice coverage, obviously very good, Joseph Cox's coverage at Vice, which seemed to suggest that um, the way in was through somehow bribing or compromising Twitter uh, employees, that they were somehow paid off or there was some inside connection that they had at Twitter. My concern slightly with that is, and I advise do very good work, but one of the things that makes them stand out is the fact they often communicate directly with, uh, with the hackers. What you're getting there is the hacker's side of the story. I suspect for the hackers, there's some reason why painting this as a sort of uh, an, an insider inside Twitter who's helping them out in exchange for money. For some reason, I think that probably works better and plays better for the hackers because the other explanation and the explanation that seems to be coming out uh, of Twitter, whether we can believe what they say or not, I, I don't know. But the explanation that seems to be coming out of Twitter is that the employees were compromised in some kind of phishing attack. So the employees at Twitter whose accounts were compromised and who were able then to be used to then take over these high, high profile accounts and tweet on their behalf those employees were somehow tricked into doing this. They weren't complicit uh, in the attack. So I find it interesting what we're going to find out about how that was done. If it is the latter case, if it is the case that Twitter employees ended up inadvertently helping the hackers out, again, we come back to this thing. If, if it's a phishing email, we're still in that loop. We're still in that, that, that stage where uh, the way into an organization and a big organization like Twitter that's well protected is by fooling the people, it's by tricking the people. The other thing, by the way, incidentally, about this... Um, uh, Twitter attack that I find quite interesting is um, uh, if you look at what happened, the attackers were able to tweet from those high profile accounts and take them over. Um, there's two interesting things about that for me. Number one, when you've got millions and millions of, of views on Twitter, when you've got millions and millions of followers at your disposal, if the best you can come up with is we're going to double the amount of Bitcoins you get. Please just send some Bitcoin to this wallet. If that's the best stab you've got, that implies to me that these are not exactly top grade hackers. I mean, the amount of damage you could do, the amount of reputational damage you could do by tweeting certain things at certain times, you know, you've got vast amounts of options there. So for example, a while ago, there was a, a hack um, on a news agency and they tweeted that there'd been, I think, a bomb attack on the White House which obviously wasn't, wasn't true. But for the short period thereafter, the share prices went crazy, the stock market plummeted, and the expectation or suspicion was that whoever was doing it knew that was gonna happen and was shorting stocks and cleaned up when the share price was changed. Again, if you've got access to people like Bill Gates and Elon Musk and so on, you know, shouldn't you do something that's gonna be more impactful than just earning 100,000 off of Bitcoin contributions? It does imply to me these weren't exactly high scale people. The other thing I find interesting about this is a little while ago, I think it sort of about a year ago, um, Jack Dorsey's account uh, at Twitter was also hacked. Um, and again, it was a sort of shout out to a couple of mates. It didn't look like the people who'd done this were particularly high scale criminals. So I don't know whether Twitter can breathe a sort of sigh of relief for the fact that it's not exactly been caught out by kind of an advanced persistent threat group or whether that makes the whole thing, uh, the whole thing worse. But the other thing I think is interesting about this is the level of access that Twitter employees seem to have, and again, we don't know the full details of this, but seem to have to people's Twitter accounts. I'm sort of struggling to sort of work out how having compromised an employee at Twitter, you can then end up being able to tweet on that person's account. Perhaps you can create a new login or register a new email address on the account. I'm not quite sure, but I think the authentication procedures and the, the, the vetting procedures definitely looking at uh, on Twitter. But this is all within the context of, of people, the hacking of people. And again, one of the things I want to talk about in terms of the coronavirus uh, pandemic and, and, and the changes that have been wrought on society because of that, if you look at those changes in working practices through the prism of hackers trying to target people, things do get a little bit more worrying. So, for example, um, uh, being able to target people late at night, maybe when they've had a couple of drinks, being able to target people with urgent messages uh, from the company saying, well, you know you're all working from home, you must download this piece of software immediately. People are outside their comfort zone, they're outside the sort of incubating force of, a, of an office environment, and they're potentially a little bit more vulnerable. They're also, frankly, using their IT a lot of the time. They might be using their own laptops, their own iPads, their own phones, and so on, and with all of the sort of bring your own device vulnerabilities that go along with that. So all of these changes in working practices, I think, are really interesting. From the defender's side, from company defender's side, 
it's really interesting as well because you know in an office environment you generally have a sort of good idea of what normal looks like and you kind of get the hang of when your employees are logging in when they're what they're doing what how they're behaving and so on suddenly you've got a whole workforce who are working from home and those working patterns that you've always relied on to sort of you know baseline what normal looks like kind of go out of the window so previously you know somebody logging into a work environment using their uh, a new device a new ipad at midnight would ring big alarm bells that would be like oh my god something's going wrong here that's unusual these days it could just be a harassed parent who spent all day homeschooling their kids and midnight's the only time they can get their work done and they're borrowing their spouse's ipad because they're at home so suddenly your ability to kind of work out what's going on and what's normal starts to diminish on the plus side um we have looked with there's been figures have come out i've been looking into this um from uh, microsoft who obviously have good visibility on uh, on the amounts of spam email going around and so on microsoft have not noticed a massive spike in spam email as a result of coronavirus which surprised me because i imagined that there would be a huge rise uh in in amounts of spam going around um microsoft did say there was a huge rise in the number of coronavirus related spam emails but that accounts for less than two percent of the overall spam and it's not like the overall spam has gone up it's just that the coronavirus emails have replaced some of the hmrc or viagra spam emails that would have got sent around again the national cyber security center has been quite uh, open about this and has said they haven't witnessed a, a rise in overall levels of cyber crime it's a bit of a sigh of relief but from talking to the tech security folks i talked to i worry that there is going to be to steal a phrase a second wave what's interesting about this for me is I always, always assumed that the cybercrime industry was very reactive and could turn on a dime. And if something like coronavirus came along, they could suddenly spin up a whole bunch of new spam campaigns. They would suddenly be unleashing a whole bunch of new viruses. They'd be getting more money in the door and so on. That hasn't happened. It strikes me that the cybercrime industry is equally as hamstrung and affected by coronavirus as the rest of us are. Because if you think about it, yes, most, a lot of cybercrime is virtual. A lot of it, it depends on virtual things like viruses and email and so on. But at the heavy end of cybercrime, there's still a lot of physical infrastructure needed. You need people to go along to the cash point and the ATM and withdraw that money. You need those people to take that money across a border. You need to hire people. You need to hire money mules. You need to hire people to take the credit cards to the bank. There's actually quite a physical element involved at the end of cybercrime. And of course, as society's locked down, as the banks have closed up, as the borders have closed, that heavy end of cybercrime has also seen itself being impacted in the same way the rest of society has been impacted. So I do wonder the extent to which cybercrime can scale up and scale down. But like I said, I do think there might be a second wave here. There's been a lot of research already around targeting things like remote desktop protocol and VPNs and trying to slip into the VPN before the VPN kicks in. Those efforts are going to be redoubled now. There's also been um, uh, lots of efforts on sort of home working uh, devices, firewall devices, and so on, trying to sort of hack into these things. That's been going on, as I understand it, for the last couple of years. What I wonder is, as we get used to working from home, and as more and more people work from home as standard, that becomes business as usual, whether we're going to see now a second wave where hackers realize, okay, let's dust ourselves down, let's look at what's going on, home working. Okay, let's target that. So I do wonder if in the coming months of the coming year or so, we are going to see a bit of a rise uh, from that perspective. Um, I think that's about it for me for the moment. I'm very happy to take questions afterwards and whether some things I've missed out. And there's also some very knowledgeable speakers coming up uh, with Rob, Pascal and Maya. So I shall hand you back to Neil now and look forward to taking your questions uh, a bit later on. Thank you. Question, Jeff, I, just, before you, uh, just before you drop off, I'll just ask kind of one question, if that's okay. Sure. Um, because I, I think it's always an interesting uh, thing around uh, kind of uh, the, the cybersecurity industry and talking about, uh, you know, how we kind of go to market and, and around the whole FUD phrase of fear, uncertainty and doubt and, and scare where is there sometimes, a, you know, that bit of a challenge between, you know, kind of talking to talking to our customers, talking to organizations about the risks on something like this. But as you say, maybe the actual, you know, kind of specific threats landscape out there didn't specifically change you know it's a from a kind of you know kind of pressing your kind of journalistic hat on you know it's kind of you know what's the what is the kind of potential impact of potentially trying to scare people more than uh, more than we necessarily need to yeah i think i mean th there is a golden opportunity now i think for tech security it's, it's, it's interesting to me from the very beginning of coronavirus it, it came up as an issue you know this thing are we safe you know those early things about zoom is zoom safe and then Boris Johnson's lot ended up leaking the, the, the Zoom ID for the meeting they were in. So it's interesting to me that, you know, tech security really 
you know, has from the beginning has been a concern for people. I think the golden opportunity now for tech security generally is to be a helpful, friendly, supportive force going forward to say, yes, we're all facing huge, you know, tumult in, in our working environments. And tech security here is here, tech security as an industry and your company's individual tech security setup is here to help you. We are a facilitator of this. You know, there's always been this thing going back, well, since time, time immemorial of tech security being a cost on the business and this idea of how can we how can we show the benefit? I think this is one of those golden opportunities, I hope is a golden opportunity where you can say, well, now here's where you see the benefit of that tech security spend because things have changed. You want to be secure. We can help you with that. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of singing from a, from a kind of privileged position here because obviously I don't run the IT security for an organization, but I do think it's one of these things. What we need now isn't the sort of traditional, oh my God, the plane's crashing. It's a kind of, we can help you get through this and we can be part of the, the change in environment. Uh, and that there was, you know, there were some positives to this. You know, I've been told that there are some advantages from a security point of view to people working from home. To a certain, sort, to a certain extent, it's easier to manage. So there are some wins there as well, but yeah, I know, I think you're right. The sort of, we've got enough fear, uncertainty and doubt in our lives with coronavirus at the moment. I, I would counsel tech security not to be adding to that load and trying to be a, a friendly handholder as we go through this. Ah, sure. Well, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that, Jeff. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to uh, start a, one of our second poll. And uh, so, you know, it'd be good to, again, get everybody's feedback uh, now on what the most common cyber threats you're seeing at the moment. You can select multiple choice on there. Again, always interesting to, to see. We always do talk about phishing a hell of a lot. It's definitely the one that kind of gets the most amount of profile um, in terms of, the, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, affecting people's, uh, you know, kind of uh, most affecting people most personally is what we see in our inbox. Um, you know, and, and it does definitely play on that human factor that, that Jeff talked about. So again, if everybody can uh, you know, give us your thoughts on that, be much appreciated. We have had a, re a excellent question about the, 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 the Twitter um, issue and the, and the, you know, the, the Bitcoin scam that was on there. I think the general consensus seems to be, again, as Jeff uh, alluded to, um, if you're going to put that much effort in, you have that much exposure, that are you really just going to get just over $100,000 worth of Bitcoin? Um, and was there something else there? Um, rather than kind of addressing that kind of question now, what we'll do is we'll, we'll bring that in at the end so all of our guest speakers can talk about that because I'm sure they'll have some, you know, really interesting perspectives on that because I think there's, there's definitely, it definitely feels like a story where there's a lot more to come and uh, not just from Twitter in terms of how they responded to it, uh, but also in terms of, you know, the, the you know, what the, the real motivations and the possible end game of the people involved in that. So again, don't forget, please put some, uh, any other questions into the chat um, so we can pick them up at the end. Uh, thanks very much for, for uh, answering some questions in the poll. Um, I think we're probably getting uh, most people have uh, voted now, so that's uh, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. We'll collate the the, the answers and we'll we'll talk about it a little bit more um, at the end uh, the session when we when we do the, the general Q and A. Okay, smashing. So what we'll do now is we'll we'll move on to our, our second speaker, who's uh, Maya Horovitz from uh, from Checkpoint. Um, over to you, Maya. Okay. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. Um, so what I want to talk about in my 10 minutes um, is since since the, the idea of this uh, meetup is, is to talk about uh, the secret life of, crim of the criminal underground, I thought I'd talk about an actual life or an actual person uh, that we were able to, to expose. Um, just to give you some uh, background, I'm the, uh, the director for Trend Intelligence and Research in Checkpoint. So I lead the team called CPR, Checkpoint Research. Uh, these are just some of our latest publications. Uh, you can see all of them and more on research.checkpoint.com. Um, so some examples are uh, for just from the last two or three months. Um, so the Florentine banker is when we were able to reveal um, cyber cyber criminals um, that were uh, that were doing very sophisticated business email compromise um, and uh, stealing millions of dollars in funds. Actually, uh, actually it was mainly in the the UK this operation. Um, we were also able to expose an APT group, the Nikon group, or one of their uh, their threat campaigns, uh, 
uh, in which they attacked um, quite a few government entities around uh, the Asia, Asia Pacific. Um, we also do some deep dive technical analysis of malware, like uh, of the 4Pix uh, botnet, which is now one of the leading botnets spreading uh, targeted ransomware. Um, and only two days ago, you might have heard of the vulnerability that we found on WinDNS, uh, that we dubbed um, Seagrad. So this is a remote code execution uh, vulnerability in WinDNS, which means that it's relevant to almost you know, every organization uh, out there and it can be used to take over uh, a network or to take down uh, a network. Microsoft gave it the perfect 10 uh, CVSS score, meaning that it's very severe and the most important thing is that it's wormable. So if you're having flashbacks from a um, from WannaCry, then you're right. It's uh, uh, it has the same devastating potential uh, that was that was uh, uh, relevant there. Uh, we also, from all of our data from our install base, we release a report every six months, uh, summarizing the trends in the cyber attack landscape. So next week we will be publishing our mid-year report uh, with everything that's new in uh, cyber attacks uh, so you are welcome to uh, visit our blog and uh, look watch out for for this uh, for this report um, so as i said in some of this research we are also lucky enough um, maybe good enough <laughs> you know to uh, to be able to track the actual threat actor who's in charge of the campaign or the malware um, and, and so today I want to, talk, to tell you the story of Vanda the God. That's how this person calls himself and how we were able to expose his real identity. So it all started uh, last October, I think it was, when we received a call from, uh, from the government in Trinidad and Tobago uh, asking us to help them uh, with a defacement that they had on one of their government uh, websites. So you can see here a defacement by what seems to be a hacktivist um, saying hacked by Vanda the God. Uh, so we wanted to understand who this person is uh, and to look for what other activity they had um, online. So as part of his activity, this is what he says about himself in his Twitter account. Uh, so he says that uh, he's, he's hacked uh, about 5,000 uh, websites. Uh, and we see some examples like universities, like government. Uh, here on, the, uh, on the, the left, you can see that he's hacked um, a Brazilian website uh, with some other content or some other hacktivism uh, about the fires in the Amazonas. Um, and we learned that he actually hacked uh, and defaced the websites of a few dozens um, of uh, government entities all around the world. Uh, but it's not only about hacktivism. Uh, and we also learned that according to him, uh, he was also in charge of stealing over 1 million, um, 1 million um, medical records of uh, citizens of New Zealand, and he was selling them um, to anyone who wants to buy <laughs> for uh, $200. Uh, so it means that he's also also after making money from his um, uh, hacking activities. Uh, because he wants people to contact him uh, and uh, give him money for the medical records, he also published uh, his email which was a great lead for us to start our investigation. Um, so his email, you can see vanda at vandathegod.com. So we looked into this domain, vandathegod.com, and we learned uh, that it was registered by someone who's probably also a neo-Nazi, you can see from his, uh, from his email address, uh, who at least allegedly lives in Uberlandia in Brazil. And I remind you that uh, he also hacked into a, to a website of the Brazilian government. 
Um, and these are some, these are the three domains that were registered by this same Gmail account. Uh, so one of them is vandadega.com, but another one is called BrazilianCyberArmy.com. So Brazilian Cyber Army, uh, we also found a clue leading to this name uh, in Vanda de Gad's, uh Twitter account. He posted this image. You can see here the logo of the Brazilian Cyber Army. And what you can also see is an open um, Facebook tab called Vanda de Assis. So who's Vanda de Assis? Turns out it's probably the same person because here you can see the Facebook account of Vanda de Assis, uh, also linking to the uh, avatar Vanda de Gad. Uh, so these two, two, these two are probably the same person uh, calling himself by different, though similar names. Um, we also have more, more uh, clues or more facts le leading us to conclude that it's the same person. Uh, you can see here that he's cross-posting the same images in both the Vanda de Gad Twitter account and the Vanda de Assis Facebook account. Um, and here is where it becomes super interesting. Uh, here you can see that from uh, that uh, from this image that was posted in the Vanda de Assis uh, account, we also can see here um, the name on the the uh, uh, on the, the upside of the, the uh, of the screen, we can see a name. Now I blurred the name because we didn't reveal his identity on our blog post, but you can see that it's MR. Okay, these are the initials of this person. Um, so we started looking for this for someone named MR or you know, the full name, uh, from Uberlandia, Brazil, which is where the person, um, you know, we, we found this, uh, this place from the, uh, from, from the, um, the domain uh, bandadega.com. So MR from Uberlandia, Brazil, there were a few people who go by this name uh, from the same city, but only one of them had this as his, um, as one of his old profile images. So the Brazilian cyber army is back and actually means that this MR person is probably the one that we are looking for. Um, now if we look again uh, at the, Van the Vanda de Gad uh, Twitter account, Vanda de Assis Facebook, both of them have cross posts uh, with MR's true profile on Facebook. Okay, so the same images appear on all these accounts. Um, so for us, it means that this is probably the same person, but of course, since it's the same image, maybe someone just copy pasted it into another, uh, another account that doesn't belong to them. Um, but the last fact that really sealed this analysis is what you'll see now. So here you can see the Twitter account of Vanda the God and uh, the Facebook account of MR from Uberlandia. And uh, everyone knows that hackers are like computer geeks. Many of them are also gamers. Um, so Vanda the God uh, is also into PlayStation and you can see him playing uh, PlayStation in both uh, in images in both accounts. Um, and the most interesting part here is that uh, you can see his TV stand, which is the same one in both images. So this is not just a cross post, it's actually two images just taken in the same place uh, by the same person. So with this, we concluded um, that uh, we are sure that Vanda de Gad is actually MR, and this is the hacker that we were looking for that, um, that had breached the websites of many government entities and also medical records and probably is in charge of the many other um, hacking activities. Um, so I'll conclude with this showing you uh, that this is Vanda de Gad's uh, Twitter account. This I took this uh, image yesterday. Um, and so it's uh, still online, but his latest post was uh, last November. And the reason is that while in his short summary about himself, he says that you cannot arrest an idea, 
uh, actually we uh, gave the Brazilian law enforcement uh, the information about his real identity uh, and shortly after they actually um, arrested him um, and so it turns out you can <laughs> arrest an idea um, and uh, with this I hope I gave you a little taste of uh, what it is to be a uh, to be to see the secret lives of the uh, the cyber criminals. Um, so yeah, this was my short story for you today. Nashi, Mike, that's uh, absolutely brilliant. Really, uh, really appreciate that. And uh, you know, I think it shows when we started off talking about people being the being the vulnerabilities and using social engineering, um, as we possibly uh, you know may well come out with a Twitter one social engineering was used, um, you know, kind of by yourselves to find the people. So kind of just a quick question on that kind of, it's interesting getting that uh, perspective that we don't always necessarily see in terms of, you know, kind of what threat research and intelligence teams uh, like the ones you run do kind of obviously a lot of it is technical based, but how much of it is, is kind of doing that social engineering and understanding that the people, uh, regardless of the, the complex VPNs and protection, and you know, kind of botnets, and you know, the way that they protect themselves. How much of that is actually just doing some good old-fashioned, you know, investigations? Um, so uh, it, it usually feels like a Sherlock Holmes story or an Agatha Christie story uh, because it's not just finding, you know, the one piece of evidence that proves that this person or this country is behind an attack. It's really just collecting. Uh, collecting different facts, um, understanding which ones are actually smoke screens uh, and which ones could not have been uh, implanted in the, the, uh, in the scene, right? So which ones are actually genuine. Uh, some of them are very, very technical, like understanding that this piece of code is very similar to another piece of code used in another malware five years ago. Uh, but some of them, like you see here, are more more colorful and uh, uh, more about the social media or dark web um, or you know just understanding that uh, people do mistakes and it's very hard to to stay um, anonymous when you when you conduct activities online um, so yeah that's the part of the fun <laughs> in the uh, in the profession I think yeah, uh, yeah, ab absolutely. And, and uh, the, just in terms of just one question that came in that just related to that, obviously, uh, kind of, I'm sure there was a lot of evidence that you kind of pulled together. But, um, you know, I suppose kind of, you know, kind of work, kind of an important part of what you guys do, as well as kind of helping organizations build better, better security posture, but working closely with, you know, with the, uh, you know, the, the authorities, with the police, um, you know, kind of in, in instances like this, I suppose it's, a, you know, kind of play a key role in providing the, the right sort of evidence for them. Yeah, so, I mean, of course, most of our work is uh, to understand the threat landscape and the attacks so that we can you know, pour this content into the, the checkpoint product and make sure that our customers are safe. But uh, then if we're looking for the greater good, then that's when we do this work that, you know, it has nothing to do with our products, but it's just, uh, in the world um, a safer place probably and just uh, giving this information to law enforcement to certs and also sharing it with the, the cybersecurity community um, so actually with our competitors and uh, giving them heads up before we publish things that can uh, that can affect their customers um, so yeah I think we should all understand that we're all on the same side of the story here that's great. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe some more, more questions that we'll, we'll come back and, and chat to you more at the end. So thank you very much. Um, you. We'll just hand over now to our next speaker. Um, so uh, Pascal from, uh, from Radware. Good afternoon, everyone. So let me share my presentation. Hope this all goes well. So if everything's good, you should see my presentation. So I elected to talk about the angle of, of DDoS and who are the actors and motives and, and some of our research be, to the people who were behind some of the DDoS attacks. 
And be, before I start talking about that, I want to, to give an overview of, of who are the actors and what motives they have or why they are doing what they're doing. So, and Jeff already talked a lot about the organized crime and also named the nation states, but there's, there's also a couple of other people there and that's one of them is competitors. And I will have an example of a competitor that might be using services from what we call the opportunistic or the organized crime. So the opportunistic hackers or the organized crime to, to perform such an attack. So angry people, of course, so, and especially in the DDoS area that because it's so easy to get access to the tools. And I'm gonna talk about the not so secret world of booters and stressor services because you, it's very easy to access them. They're, they're just on the clear net. You go to the internet, you search on Google, you type in booter and stressor, and you will find a whole list of services out there that you can use and abuse to attack other people. The idea, of course, behind those websites is to test your own infrastructure. But if you can put in an IP address without anybody certifying that it's really your IP and that you are the owner of that domain, well, it becomes actually an attack tool. So, and we have seen lots of, of, of those coming up and, and even the Dutch police so last year, they took down about 15 of those booter and stressor services, but we see them come back. So it's not like it made a little blip and it was a little bit calmer in terms of DDoS attacks, but that only lasted for a few weeks before news started popping up. And I want to show through this presentation how easy it actually is and who are the people behind it, what drives them and how did they get there? So one of the most important tools, and I already mentioned the, the DDoS as a service in terms of booter and stressor services, but botnets is what most of those people are after. They want to create a great botnet so that they can attack people. And what is a botnet? A botnet is an army of devices. And Geoff also referred to the IoT and to the routers that are getting abused and getting attacked. Well, that's what those people are doing. They, they have a whole lot of vulnerabilities at their disposal that have been disclosed between 2016 and now that they can abuse. And, and one of the recent one that we found was a malware that was actually abusing like 16 different vulnerabilities to get into as much devices as possible, get into the device, take ownership of the device. And once they have ownership, they will have them call back home to a infrastructure that they will use to orchestrate all those devices and make them attack all together. So the idea is to use all this firepower, thousands, maybe millions of devices around the world that they will orchestrate in a single attack to attack a victim. Now, of course, those bot herders that create that infrastructure, they can use it for themselves. And we will see in a second how they can make money out of that. But also they rent it out. So they, they create APIs, they create a booter and stressor service around it, and then they rent it out to whoever wants to perform a DDoS attack. And I give you the example of a disgruntled employee or a customer that is unhappy. Well, he can go out there and he can rent that service and for, for five to $20, he can already, do an attack that brings down most of the websites that, that are online today. So like a 20 to 100 gigabit per second attack for 10 to 15 minutes. And he can cause some damage and he can, especially in the reputation of those people. So an, another way of making money out of those DDoS attacks is what we call the ransom DDoS campaigns. And this is an example of, of what we saw in November, 2019. So that was a campaign of somebody posing as Fancy Bear and it wasn't Fancy Bear. So Fancy Bears is an APT group from Russia. Um, typically they don't do in DDoS attacks or at least not in ransom DDoS. But uh, this person just used that name to instill fear into the people. So when you get an email and somebody tells you, hey, I'm Fancy Bear, I'm that popular hacker group, search me on Google and you will see all kinds of disasters that I created and that I am behind. So, and I'm telling you, your network will be subject of a DDoS attack very soon, unless you pay up and then they give a Bitcoin address and then they give a fee to do it. Now, in this case, the letter surfaced and, and there were some, some campaigns around that. Now you have two kinds of campaigns. Um, you have the ones that are really ransom DDoS campaigns where you have seen that customers have been attacked afterwards if they didn't pay. Now we also have seen Lots of hoaxes. That means and everybody can write this email and say, okay, I'm going to attack you within 24 hours if you don't pay up. And unfortunately, it happens that people pay up. So just like with the phishing emails, just like with the Twitter attack from yesterday, some people still fall for that trick. 
Now, one of the most important events that triggered everything in, in the DDoS area for those botnets and especially turning to IoT devices was the, the, were the attacks on Krebs and on Dyn in October of 2016. And that all started with, with, with the botnet that was called Mirai. And the person that was behind that botnet was uh, Paras Ja. So this person was fresh out of university and during university he already had a background in DDoS attacks because it came out that he was already, for people, for students paying him, he was already attacking the university and bringing it down during times of uh, examination. So, so when there was exams, he would attack them for a small fee by the students and that's how he makes some, some pocket change. But at some point he was also a fanatic Minecraft gamer. So, and then as you saw from Maya's presentation, so yeah, those, those attackers, most of the time they're into gaming and, and he's a Minecraft gamer. Now, Minecraft are servers that can bring up to thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of, of euros per week because those servers can be rented out and they can be modded and they can add new things to it. So hosting those servers is actually a good business. And a lot of people pay money to get access to their private server. So those servers, of course, when you have gaming and we have competition, you also have DDoS attacks. So gamers attacking each other, competition attacking because they want to sell their server uh, for, 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 for more money and they want to make some promotion out of it. So they just DDoS attack the competitor. So in this case, you need a DDoS solution. So, and there's a couple of DDoS solutions that are out here, like ProxyPike and ProDraft solutions. And one of those solutions was from Paris. So he was actually a provider of DDoS solution. And also at the same time, he was the creator of a DDoS botnet. And his botnet he was using to attack his competitors and to, to prove that his solution was, was actually better and also to sell his solution. Now, he also rented it out on the site to other people. And those other people used it to do an attack against Crips on, on security website. So, so Krebs website was taken down by, by a fairly powerful botnet and that triggered things because Krebs is an investigative reporter. So he started searching for who is behind that. And he came up with this whole chart that you see here. So that, that's was taken from his article and that's how, how they came after Paras Ja and, and what he did. He was not working alone. He also had Joshua White and they, they were all convicted for, for the work they did. Now Mirai was an important step because between the Krebs and the Dyn attack, and the Dyn attack happened like a couple of days after the Krebs attack, but in between the source code of Mirai was open source. So that means that now anyone on the internet had access to that bot. And to this date, we still see that most of the IoT DDoS botnets are still based from Mirai. So there's a couple of base like Qbot, Bashlight, but also Mirai and Kraken. So, so th th those are the most important one where new IoT bots are coming from. And Mirai actually set the stage for a whole new level of DDoS attacks. Now, Gen X is one of the groups that we also came after um, and that, that we saw performing some attacks in our honeypots and that we research uh, what is happening. And Gen X, the name comes actually from the binary itself, which was called Jennifer. Um, and that Jennifer was, the name was too long, so we made it shorter to, to Gen X. And those people were in Grand Theft Auto. So, so what they did is actually they had services that they sold Grand Theft Auto sandboxes that could be customized by their customers. And they had a nice business model because on the side for their customers, they also sold the service of attacking their competitors so that their customer can actually gain more business. So we found uh, a botnet that, start, that they were starting to create. And we also saw on their website that once we, we got on their website, we saw that they have on the one side, they have the server for hosting that Grand Theft Auto gaming sir, platform. But on the other side, they also have this extra service, the full-in service that for $20, they will attack your competitor and bring down the platform of your competitor. And before they started creating the bots, the two lines here in red were not there yet. So that was on January 30th. And when we discovered the bot started to grow and we came after who they were, we followed all the 
the, the breadcrumbs to get to a group that called themselves San Calvici and that apparently was very popular also in the gaming uh, because they have been trolling around quite a lot in the gaming uh, community for, for people that are doing a lot of gaming in, in Grand Theft Auto. So and this website is just on the surface web. So for $20, they just created the 300 gigabit per second DDoS attack bot that you can, that you can rent and attack pretty much any service. Here's another example, that's Putin's stressor. And I didn't check if it was online still, but uh, like one year ago, I went into Putin's stressor and just looked around. And here you can see some of the things. So you see the number of attacks. Those are all the different attacks on the right side that they can do. And you see that they're hosting their services off known platforms like OVH, like Voxility. So uh, link 11, so they have different platforms where they host their bots and where they host their servers. And depending on the platform, one has more features than the other. They have more ports open than the other, uh, more things that are allowed. So they will allow people to use that platform to perform attacks. And it's easy to get in. You can just create an account, you go in. Of course, don't use your real email address, don't use your real IP address, but you can easily go in. And you can also see for paying, you can pay with PayPal, but of course you can also pay with other. And one of the things that, that, that was interesting in this case that you also can pay with uh, um, Counter-Strike skins. So CSGO skins can be worth a lot of money and you can just pay them by giving them skins and they will sell them on eBay or in another marketplace. And that's how they get to money. So again, gamers that were behind that service. Now, another person that performed in a DDoS attack, and that was in the end of 2016, and there was an article that came out that Liberia was knocked offline from the internet because of a DDoS attack. And actually, the target there was not Liberia, but it was a, a person that, uh, Daniel K was his name, so he goes under the handle of Best Buy, and we will, have, we will see him come back when I talk about Marketplace. But he, he was advertising around that time a botnet of 400,000 Mirai bots, and the time that he advertised that, actually a couple of days later, Deutsche Telekom was impacted by, by an event that, that caused a blip in about 900,000 of their managed routers. So, and that was actually Daniel K. He found a new vulnerability and was trying to exploit that vulnerability. It went wrong. So luckily it failed in, 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 in what he aimed to do, which was actually infecting all those 900,000 modems. It failed, but still 900,000 people were disconnected from the internet. So he was behind that attack on Deutsche Telekom as well. Um, but he had a 400,000 bot army. And apparently afterwards, when in 2018, he was in court, the court proceedings came out. And in the court proceedings, it said that there was a Cellcom employee that approached him and paid him up to $10,000 a month to use his skills to do as much as possible damage to their biggest competitor in Liberia, which is Lone Star. And that was the reason that Liberia was knocked offline because he was attacking with his botnet. He was attacking Lone Star service, but Liberia didn't have enough uplink connectivity. And, and actually it, it took the whole country offline for, for a couple of hours. So, but this is an example of, of where competition happens. So the competition going up to, and of course, Cellcom is not aware of that, that employee doing it, but this employee, this individual went up to K and said, okay, I pay you that much if you attack those guys for me. So that's another way of, of them making money. Now, a totally different kind of person is the, the janitor and the janitor, I, I don't know if I need to classify him as a superhero or an activist or, or anyway, he did, bad things and he destroyed and he disrupted businesses. So, so he's in the attacker category. But the janitor built what he called the bricker bot. And that was like in the time that all those vulnerabilities and mirrors were starting to come and no modem was safe anymore. And he got tired of all that insecure, uh, all these insecure places. So he started building his own weapon and his weapon was actually like a sensor shield that he built. And the irony of it is that he actually hacked into modems and used those modems to build his sensor shield. So it was actually a botnet that he manually built out. And what that sensor shield did was listen. So, so whenever a device get infected with Mirai, it starts scanning for new victims, searching for new victims. And he would pick that up and he would counterattack them. 
And instead of cleaning them, he was breaking them. So he actually went in and just broke the modem. So he was writing random strings to the flash so that the modem or the IP camera, that it cannot respond anymore, that it needs a reboot. Modems can be reflashed, but as you know, most of the IP cameras, especially the cheaper ones, they don't have a serial port, they don't have a USB port, so actually your device is broken. So, and he called his project Internet Chemotherapy, and he was active for about one year and a half doing all that thing. And there were some, some like 60,000 Indian modems. There was also a whole provider in California, Sierra Tel, that went down overnight because of his doing. And he, he did much more than, than that, but those are like the two highlights. Um, he's not active anymore, but that was like an activist that was trying to go against those attackers, but doing it in the wrong way, but actually breaking devices from other people. So where do you find those people and, and where, where do they sell or where do they market their products? And I already talked about Daniel K and Daniel K here on the left side on the top, you have the Jabber tool. So XMPP, he, at that time he was using Jabber and he was selling their spots in his biggest Mirai botnet. And you can see in the top that he says that his Mirai botnet is 400K devices. And there's actually screenshots from that. More recent was um, on YouTube. So when you go on YouTube, you can search for Mirai or you can search for DDoS botnet and you will find lots of movies from, from, from those opportunistic hackers that took the source code, compiled the source code and built their own botnet. Um, people like Nexus Zeta, for example, are also in that family. They find a vulnerability, they will use that vulnerability, they will put it in and then they will build their own botnet and then they will start to, 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 to try to get into devices. And then once they have enough devices, they want to sell it, of course. So YouTube is another way of doing it. And typically to get in touch with them, you would go through Discord, again, one of the services that came up with the gaming uh, industry. So Discord is that chatting forum, uh, voice chatting and also tech, text chatting that is mostly used by gamers before, but now has become more and more notorious for, for other things as well. The attackers that attacked Zoom were also on Discord, by the way. Uh, hopefully they don't have the ID or password for this meeting. And also lately we see more and more, and those are two very recent ones, um, people that are selling their DDoS services um, through, through Instagram. Uh, and to say the secret life, well, I have to say that, that those guys are more active on Twitter than, than I am. So they're, they're not so much under the cover. They are trying to promote their botnet. That's one way of, of, of that, that they are doing that. And they're selling it on Instagram. So Instagram is for them like a, a great platform to, to sell that on. So they, they are very opportunistic, uh, mostly young people. Um, as you can see by the plant on his Instagram, sometimes drugs are involved. Um, some, most of them are pretty young. Um, and they get into that, yeah, because they need some pocket change or they want some e-fame, they, they, they want some recognition that they do that or bragging rights in their community. And they get access to forums on the clear net. They, they don't need to go to the dark web per se. There, there's enough forums on the clear net that you can get access. However, some forums that are more interesting into deeper hacking, you have to do an exploit before you can get in. That means that you have to do a real hack or attack somebody and prove it before you can get in. So, so that's the kind of people that, that are around the IoT devices and trying to, to get your modem that's at home and infect it with, with a bot so that they can use that and leverage that to attack bigger companies and bring down businesses. Fascinating. Well, uh, thank you very much, Pascal. Uh, yeah, absolutely fascinating. Interesting to see the, the thread of, uh, of a gaming coming in, but also that kind of competition, that kind of, you know, very... You know, there isn't a, a, a simple line between white hat and black hat. There's obviously a lot of grey hat, um, you know, in there in, in, involved. That uh, it's not as simple as good and bad, clearly. Yeah, no, yeah. The, the the lines are confusing, and and we also see that sometimes the threshold depends a little bit on people. But but when you get close to those people, you know how easy it is to cross that line. So yeah. it's only a thin line, and it needs only a little bit of expertise to get over that line. And that's that's the danger of, of, of all these attacks and yeah. what's behind those actors. Fascinating. Well, thank you very much for that. Yep, absolutely fascinating. Okay. Uh, we'll just move on now to our, our, our final speaker, um, who's uh, Rob from Finn. Hello, everyone. Hi, let me, uh, let me share my screen. Um, and, um, and yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get going. So, um, 
Yeah, it was kind of interesting uh, a little bit earlier talking about sort of viruses and the first viruses we remember. I mean, I, I was kind of thinking back even further to like the ping pong virus and the stone virus, right? And these are the kind of things that kept me awake when I was uh, when I was a teenager. So may maybe showing my age here. Um, what I really wanted to talk about today, um, sort of really, really quick overview is, is a topic I call building an identity defined network for, for zero trust access. Now, I think, um, you know, given what, what we've heard from the speakers before, um, wow, it's, it's pretty scary out there, isn't it? I mean, it, it sounds like there are, there are all sorts of people <laughs> with, uh, with various motives out there, but the thing that, that sort of unites them is that they, they all seem to be pretty hell bent on, on causing harm. And, um, you know, if, if you're sort of running, uh, uh, you know, running organizational IT, especially involved in the security side of things right now, um, it, there's just a huge number of threats out there that, that you need to protect yourself from. Um, and, and we keep hearing that, you know, one of the, um, one of the key things uh, that, um, or one of the key weaknesses, I guess, is uh, the very people that you're trying to provide services to, uh, you know, the, the people who work for you. Um, and, 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 you know, they can be targeted through all sorts of things like, you know, sort of phishing attacks. Um, but they could also be trying to use equipment that's being compromised. So all kinds of, of, of bad things can, can happen. But let's, um, let's start off with, you know, sort of like a, 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 lesson, a lesson from history, right? And the, the idea of, of perimeter security. Um, now, now, obviously, this, uh, this, this used to be a, a very popular way of, of keeping ourselves safe, you know, going back to sort of medieval times. Uh, you had all of the good guys and all of the things that you cared about um, in, in one place. You centralized it and you built a really big wall around it. Um, and uh, you made that wall as strong as you possibly could. And um, yeah, and, and then in, in that way, you, you managed to keep things safe. Um, of course, you know, history is probably littered with examples of, of what the problem was with the concept of perimeter security. Um, you know, Trojan horse, uh, Trojan horse, I guess, is even a term that we that we use within cybersecurity now for a type of exploit, um, you know, that, that poses as, as something uh, that might be benign or might even be beneficial. But actually what's inside it is, is pretty dangerous. Um, and, and that's pretty much the, the, the same sort of problem that we have with, um, you know, a lot of perimeter based network security today is that if you're putting all of those controls and you're putting all of your eggs into that, that one basket of, um, you know, keeping the bad guys on the outside and, and the good guys on the inside, uh, what happens if one of the bad guys manages to get inside and then you don't have, um, you know, you don't have any sort of mitigating controls to, uh, to keep you safe once, uh, you know, once the bad guys in, is in the wrong place within within your network. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about the, the sort of the concept of perimeter security within, let's say, corporate IT um, and, and, you know, see, see how things are, are changing. Um, you know, we talk about yesterday's world. I mean, things obviously change really quickly, but, but I think certainly in, in the past, it, it was a reasonably fair assumption to make um, that you could have um, all of the things that you cared about on the, the inside of your corporate firewall, right? Um, you'd have your office users and they'd, they'd all be working happily at their desks. Uh, they'd be using, you know, applications that were all hosted on premise in your own data center. They were using devices that, that you'd issued to them. Um, and you could, you know, periodically run scans on and you could ensure that they had the correct antiviruses and personal firewalls and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, and, and all of that obviously was, uh, was great. And, and you could keep, keep it safe, keep the, the good things happening on, on the inside and, and the bad things happening outside. Um, but then a lot of, a lot of things started to change. Um, a, a number of, of, of paradigms um, that, that started to upend this pattern. Um, you know, the shift to cloud, of course, is one of them where uh, the likelihood is that you're running some, if not most of your services in public cloud or, or maybe in private clouds, uh, a number of private clouds, if you're following a, a multi-cloud strategy. Um, but you can no longer say that all of your users are, are, you know, sort of inside your perimeter, either you'll have remote users, you'll have partner users, uh, bring your own devices has obviously become a, a, a really, really popular uh, mo um, model as well. Um, and then of course, you know, you, you may be exposing APIs publicly um, or, or other things like that as well. So, and digital transformation, I guess, is one of the things that, that's really that's really changing this. Uh, new ways of working, um, new patterns of access, um, really tends to to redefine those perimeters. And I, I guess up until maybe three or four months ago, this probably would have been you know the point at which we stopped with this picture. Um, 
But then, of course, we had, uh, you know, we had another global event that, that significantly changed it as well, which is, of course, COVID-19. And it, it didn't so much just redefine that security perimeter as just absolutely destroy it or make it absolutely irrelevant. I mean, you know, <laughs> what we see here is we still have the corporate firewall, but there's not really very much inside it anymore. The chances are that the vast majority of your employees are going to be, are going to be working uh, from home or from anywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, those corporate devices have, have gone with them uh, out of your control. And it's, it's really hard to, to you know, to, to really uh, keep that strong security posture uh, around, um, around all of those, those things when that, that control has, has gone away. So, so what we're looking at and what we're seeing, uh, you know, we're advising organizations to do is to move away from the concept of network-based trust, uh, more towards the, the, the idea of zero trust. Now, zero trust doesn't mean that you, you don't trust anything, but what it means is that you, you don't implicitly trust. Um, you know, you go from this model where trust is, a, is an on-off thing to where trust is something that, that you define on a case-by-case -case basis based on the risk. And, and your risk, of course, is, is made up of various different factors. Um, one of them, obviously, and the one that for us is really important, is the identity of the individual, how strongly that identity has been, has been established within the context of that transaction. Um, but also things like, you know, what is the device that they're coming from? What is their location? And then also, what is the specific uh, activity, task, or application that they're trying to access? The, um, the other thing, of course, is that when it comes to how and where this trust is enforced, moving away from a model where there's a single, if you like, network boundary that defines uh, what should be trusted on the one side and what should not be trusted on the other side. It moves you more towards the concept of micro perimeters where each resource, each application, each file, each API, each endpoint has its own, uh, has its own perimeter, has its own way of enforcing uh, that, that trust boundary. Um, so, and obviously a lot of organizations are talking about the concept of zero trust and about the zero trust model, um, but they agree that, you know, the concept of identity is, is really foundational to being able to do zero trust well. Um, you know, Forrest is saying that, you know, command and control over it, who accesses the network and ultimately the data is key to zero trust. If you don't know who it is that's trying to get in, there's absolutely no way that you can make a sensible risk-based decision as to whether that access should be allowed or blocked or whether to, to step up the authentication. Again, Google have put forward a model called Beyond Corp for, for how they see the, um, you know, how they see the enterprise of the future. Uh, again, all access to every resource, fully authenticated, authorized and encrypted. Um, based upon not only the device context, but then also those those user credentials. So, as you know, as, as sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> I mentioned the the G word, and and one of my uh, home devices unfortunately started speaking at that point. So, <laughs> I just hope it hasn't been compromised by anything too bad. Um, so yeah, but then again, when we when we come to uh, to zero trust access, I mean, obviously it's a journey. We define a, a number of different stages on the way to to zero trust. Um, uh, workload security, transaction security, and data security are really important. But for us, the the concept of strong strong authentication um, is is really key to to being able to make a start with uh, with zero trust. Um, and and obviously, sort of moving moving ahead to that. The concept of, of global authentication, the concept of being able to centralize and manage and monitor and enforce the right authentication for your users, regardless of where they're coming from, regardless of where they're going to and what they're trying to access, or which channel, which device um, they, they happen to be using. Um, a number of factors, obviously, that, uh, that are really key in that, and we see that in those, those sort of five points there, uh, who, what, when, why, and, and from where. Um, you know, incorporating aspects of, of who the user is, uh, how have they identified themselves, have we used biometrics, have we used behavioral biometrics, um, what do we know about the device, when last did we check that device that they're coming from, is it a managed device, in which case we could maybe assign a little bit more trust to it, or is it an unmanaged device that we know nothing about, in which case we have to assume that it's a compromised device. Um, learning also from the context of the of the access and also you know what we know about historical behavior of that user um, you know I think there was an, an example earlier about that the harassed parent who, who comes online sort of late at night 
to uh, to try and catch up on some work because you know they've been trying to trying to deal with their with their kids all day. Um, certainly, the first time that happens, we should we should detect an anomaly and we should we should step up the authentication that's required. But if we see that pattern of behaviour starting to continue, uh, we should be able to learn over time that this is a more regular pattern or a more usual pattern of access for that individual, and start to train our models to recognise that better. Um, and then, of course, the other thing that's really important, maybe just the, the sort of the closing point here, is, is in terms of what is the, uh, what is the intent, uh, what is it that we're actually trying to access, um, and what is the risk associated with it, so that we can make sure that we're applying uh, the appropriate security controls based on, on the value of what it is that, uh, that we stand to lose. Um, so there we go. My little countdown timer has just stopped and I think I have actually managed to keep to 10 minutes, which is quite unusual for me. So, so I'll hand over at that point for, for any questions. If, uh, Actually, uh, thank you very any. much, Rob. Um, and no uh, obviously you in Zoom bingo uh, for setting off one of your smart home devices. So, um, <laughs> you know, that I, for those of you playing at home, you can now mark your cards um, in that. I suppose kind of just one question in terms of uh, what you were talking about there. It, you know, it's interesting, you know, we, we always, you know, a, a common thread uh, kind of throughout the presentations and the talks has been around the people, you know, whether it's kind of social engineering, kind of either uh, kind of targeting and, and from a cyber crime or, or kind of going back the other way and then moving, you know, kind of how we're, we're approaching that, changing our security posture to organizations to defend itself, defend themselves. And, and obviously, as you mentioned, zero trust is, you know, one of those kind of uh, frameworks that a lot of organizations are moving towards. But what does that mean for the average user? You know, it, it's really important for us, you know, as, as cybersecurity professionals to take users on the journey, that they need to be part of it. We talk about them being the first line of defense. Mm -hmm. But then when we talk to them about we're going to implement a zero trust model, the average user can go, that's absolutely terrific. Does that mean I'm not allowed to do anything anymore? You know, what, what does that kind of in practicality, uh, in practical terms, what does that mean for them? Yeah, so I mean, I th this this one has been uh, it, it, it's one of those trade offs that, that we're constantly trying to get right. Um, it's security on one hand, and then it's productivity and usability on on the other hand. Um, zero trust does not mean that there's never any trust and that everything has to always be, uh, you know, the maximum friction possible and the max maximum number of authentication steps and, and, uh, and, and factors possible every time you, you try to do anything. Um, I think the point about zero trust is more, it's almost like understanding your own unconscious biases in some ways, right? If we're going to segue into, into other topics that, 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 are, that are sort of very popular at the moment is, you know, understanding where are the points in your security posture where you are making assumptions based on things that you think you know about the trustworthiness of, of a particular operation. Um, and, and having the, uh, let, let's say, having the, the capabilities in place to really be able to perform those, you know, adaptive or dynamic checks at that point to determine whether this really is something that you should just let go through um, you know, let's say under the current session that's uh, that's already been established, or whether it's something maybe where you where you need to do something like a transaction based step up. Um, you know, so may, maybe trust but verify is kind of the the, the model that we that we're moving towards here. But we have to take users with us on the journey, and I mean, you know. One of the things that, that our own uh, CISO does a lot is send us phishing campaigns internally. Um, I actually fell for one, <laughs> which is an embarrassing <laughs> thing to admit. It came on a Friday afternoon, just as we were starting a company-wide sync. And it was uh, it purported to be from, from our head of HR saying something along the lines of, you need to click this link, otherwise you're gonna lose your, your vacation balance, right? Um, which of course is one of these things that it was designed just to sort of trigger that, oh no, I need to do something right now kind of emotion. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, you can only do so much with technology and the rest of it, you, you actually really have to do by, by user education as well, which is, which is another fundamental pillar in this. Thank you. So, um, yeah, a really, uh, really insightful look at uh, Zero Trust. Thanks very much. If I can just invite the, uh, the other panelists to just uh, join us again. We've had a few more kind of questions come in. And it'd be interesting to just kind of go around everybody with uh, with some of those. So, you know, kind of one of the first ones that we uh, kind of we addressed a little bit at the start, and, and uh, kind of you know around the, the the publicity side of side of things. So, in terms of those, those cyber threats around around kind of Corona specific attacks and what have you, 
uh, the kind of question of how much of that is hype and how much of that re is is reality. Um, I, I, su I suppose kind of we, we did talk about that being um, not that much of a, a massive issue. Um, but in terms of the things that it's changed, um, what kind of long term trends, uh, you know, or, or long term impact or lessons, you know, can we learn from the way that the, the security and cybercrime landscape has, has has kind of changed over the last uh, the last five months? So maybe if I kind of you know, start with you, Jeff. Um, I think it's interesting. I think that the the what's really interesting for me is the coronavirus pandemic has speeded up a whole bunch of trends that were already existing because of technological changes. So the key one is the breakdown between public life and private life. You know, from the very beginning, there's been this, if you look at Facebook, it's classic push is to make what was private now public. You know, frankly, I'm sitting in my home, you guys are sitting in your homes, you know, well, most of you I suspect. Um, you know, that, that breakdown between public and private uh, is, is a sort of mega effect of the internet generally. And I think coronavirus has massively speeded it up. So again, I think in terms of cybersecurity, it's going to be that it, there's always been this issue of, you know, bring your own device. And as, as Rob talked about, you know, the idea that there is no perimeter because your employees and increasingly your resources are outside that perimeter. I think coronavirus has just massively sped that up. Um, uh, the other thing I think, I mean, I don't know what if it's going to happen on cybersecurity, but the cashless society, um, I think has been massively sped up by this as well. Um, there was an announcement recently, I think one of the ATM companies was, 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 pulling out a whole bunch of destinations, uh, locations, you know, we are, we are moving rapidly to a cashless society. Um, people are going to be using cards more, the, you know, the ability to use cash is going to diminish. So there'll, there'll be more, um, uh, more cashless transactions going on. So I'm interested by the effect of that. It's probably one uh, down the line, but I think those are the two big trends I'd pick out. Okay. Uh, Maya, from your perspective, what, you know, what do, you, do you feel that we can kind of learn most and what's going to kind of change? Uh, most significantly for us, uh, you know, in terms of our cybersecurity approach. Um, yeah, so of course, more more attacks are targeting all the uh, remote workers, uh, and so the security also goes in this direction. Uh, but the one thing I want to highlight here is that uh, although there's a hype, you know, saying there are more attacks because of the pandemic, there's the cyber pandemic. Um, that's 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 wrong and that's just creating um, uh, you know just creating panic I think um, when we're looking at the numbers and we have uh, the logs of the attacks from about a 100,000 networks and millions of mobile devices and endpoints and cloud environments and everything we are seeing that actually since March there was a decline in the number of attacks out there. And it's just starting to get back to normal uh, in the last month or so. But actually there were more, there were less attacks than usual. We are also seeing it, the, the same uh, the same trend when looking in uh, virus total, you know, the huge repository of files. Um, we are seeing that in virus total, there are now more, less malicious files that are being uploaded to virus total than, than I'm than uh, usual. So it means that there are less attacks. Also, some of the largest botnets like Emotet are kind of on vacation. They usually take vacations on holidays. So maybe, you know, the pandemic is another holiday for them. Uh, so there are less attacks. We actually debated among ourselves whether or not to publish these numbers because uh, you know we're a security company, so it goes against what we are trying to convince. The marketing our audience. Would be furious. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's the truth, so that's what we published. Of course, there are more attacks that are related to COVID-19. So uh, phishing attacks, more the themes of the, the malicious emails are more related to like, do you want information about the virus or. Uh, be first to get a vaccine uh, or, uh, I don't know, get a free uh, Netflix account because everyone is bored. <laughs> so, uh, um, so more attacks are related to this theme, but all in all, there are less attacks than usual, actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Pascal, from, from what you're, you're saying in terms of, you know, kind of, kind of, a, kind of a permanent shift in, in direction or kind of, you know, carrying on as we... Kind of the, the similar linear approach. Yeah, to 
to come to the point that that, that Maya was was talking about, I'm fully aligned with with what she's saying. So the number of attacks, we don't see a severe increase in number of attacks. And I wouldn't say that DDoS, we saw a decrease in attacks. Um, I think they DDoS has its own tidal wave that it's going on, and every year it gets a little bit higher in terms of number of DDoS attacks and especially the volumes because of the tools and also the digitalization that Joff was uh, referring to. So, so we see bigger attacks and a and, and little bit more attacks, but I wouldn't specifically attribute that to COVID. I would certainly make it more of the tidal wave that we always see. Now, I think that in the perception to people has changed a little bit because I think there's more successful attacks lately. And I would not either completely attribute that to COVID. However, COVID made people sensitive in, 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 in the area that they have a need for information. So when they get an email about that promises information about COVID and promises statistics, they will click on it. And, and they, they will probably much faster click on that email than they did like two months before the pandemic because they're really in need for that information. And the other one is fear. They, they can easily abuse that fear and, and, and use it to do different things. Now, another shift that we saw and that we actually were able to measure is in scraping. So bad bots scraping data and trying to get information and collect that information to create their own websites. And again, that's coming into the need for information is bots that were scraping articles that contained COVID and articles that contained hand sanitizer, things like that. So what they doing is actually they take all those articles, they put up a website that sounds very interesting to people to come, but it's not their content. They did not make that content. It's all copyrighted content from other websites, from other journalists like Joff's content. They go and scrape it, put it on their website. They bring it all together like an aggregator, but an illegal one. And that's how they try to attract people to come in and then put in links that either might uh, give drive-by malware, or it might be links that give access to advertising clicks. So, so they use it for, for a lot of bad things. And we saw a little increase in, in that activity, more specifically towards COVID. But yeah. otherwise, I think that most of it, it's hard, really hard to tie that back to COVID. Yeah. And just touching on that, kind of one of the polls that we asked was if people have seen a rise in uh, cybercrime. And it was, it was, you know, kind of just over two thirds of people have said yes. Um, you know, kind of 40% a little, but 27% a lot. So I think the majority is people have definitely, they've either seen more, there's, there's that feeling, there's that perception. It's a perception, yeah, because yeah, if, yeah. if you read more about it, you think that, okay, more is happening. Now, people yeah. also have more time to read, so maybe they come more, yeah. <laughs> more aware of what's happening in the yeah. world, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and kind of just touching on the kind of threats that people kind of see in terms of uh, the, the most visible, uh, the, the, the top one uh, by a kind of massive margin was kind of 81% of, of people kind of listed phishing as being the primary one. And the second one uh, was, was stolen credentials around 42%. So again, coming back to that topic of, you know, around identity and around people, um, kind of, you know, Rob, from, from your perspective, you know, is that kind of the, the direction again that, that you're seeing, you know, kind of in terms of that shift, that ever increasing focus on compromising individuals rather than, rather than networks? Yes, I think so. Um, it, it's quite interesting that, you know, our, our sort of position and, and the, the advice that we give companies really hasn't changed. It, it, you know, um, I think that, that multi-factor authentication is still proven to be one of the, the, you know, the simplest things that you can do to, to prevent uh, phishing, um, to protect yourself against phishing and against the impact of, of stolen credentials. Um, the need for it obviously seems to be, seems to be accelerating um, you know, again, not to not to sort of rehash material from from the presentation, but I think in in a, a lot of places, a lot of organisations that that haven't really yet embraced a a fully rem or a remote culture. You know, even before the pandemic, weren't really doing much in terms of work from home. weren't really doing much in terms of supporting remote workers, and often those are those are the organisations that actually had the biggest need for security because of their their feeling was is that their 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 assets were were so critical that they could not risk access to those assets from outside their premises and they'd focus a lot on physical security as well. Yeah. Um, those are the kinds of organizations that, have, that, you know, I guess in a lot of ways really had the rug pulled out from under them when COVID-19 hit. Um, you know, we, we spoke to, to, one, uh, to, to one of our customers who, you know, had, had a problem where suddenly the, even their VPN couldn't 
you know, couldn't cope with the, with the, you know, tenfold increase in, in traffic before we even got to, you know, the concept of, of how you authenticate those users. It's like that, that infrastructure just wasn't there to, to support it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, for us, we, we've, we've said for a, for a long time that, you know, sort of strong authentication and, and, you know, encouraging really good behavior and good hygiene around identity is, is one of the absolute foundation or pillars of strong cybersecurity and then COVID-19 has certainly not done anything to change that. In fact, it's, it's, it's probably just reinforced that message. Yeah, we've had a kind of one question and I was just going to kind of wrap up with one, but I think it's kind of, you know, an interesting, I'll kind of see if we can kind of tie them together. I think what one trend obviously that we, you know, that everybody talks about in terms of increasing use of uh, cloud computing and that has undoubtedly, we've seen a huge acceleration around that, whether you talk about, you know, kind of uh, using public apps or digital transformation or what have you. I think the the move to, to to move networks into the cloud to have more control and scalability and agility is has definitely accelerated over this this recent time. So, um, you know, kind of I, I think that's definitely definitely kind of permanent shift for many organisations moving over there. But on the on the, the flip side of because our, our employees are now. Uh, are kind of working from home and further away. While we have kind of greater visibility, uh, we always had that visibility um, in terms of what was going on a network. Now, not only do we have have the cloud, which is obviously no longer our, our you know, our, our networks, it's someone else's computer is the, the best description I've ever heard of the cloud, but also our employees are out of sight. So, you know, is, is there a real challenge there of actually really struggling? We don't always necessarily see what does go on because we no longer have visibility of, you know, of, of absolutely everybody, you know, every endpoint or every device or every person in the same way that we used to, hmm. you know, I'll, I'll open that up for anybody who wants to. I, I think just, try, you know, the others will have a, a other views, but for me, what's interesting about this is liability. You know, if, if you're, if one of your empo employees loses data, accesses data, you know, at home on a home device on a home network, if there's some compromise of their router, where does your, how far do your tendrils from your organization reach into their homes? And also there's issues, it's slightly fringe issues perhaps, but you know, if an employee accesses something that they shouldn't do that causes them psychological harm, if they, you know, if they end up accessing material that they shouldn't access and that causes them problems, there's sort of liability issues around this. Again, this blending of the workplace and the home environment, I can see some thorny issues coming up around that. And I don't know where GDPR sort of sits in this and how you police all of that. Uh, my worry being a lot of people seem to, the answer just seems to be, well, we have a VPN. It's fine. Just VPN. And I'm not sure whether that sort of, that's your single point of, if that is your single point of failure, that that's something to be taken quite seriously. Um, so those, those are my thoughts, but I'm sure others will have smarter ideas. Yeah, I would say uh, if you have a VPN, it's a good thing. But if you have that S3 bucket left open publicly so that everybody can access it and download it, that VPN will not do anything for that access. So yeah, we, we lost visibility in the cloud, but I think it will will become even worse if you think about the use cases that are coming now it's more of the edge cloud so we're moving services from a central global cloud to the edge cloud we're moving it to the mobile edge to support autonomous cars smart cities uh, things that are connecting talking to each other they all need low latency so what is happening is that we're actually moving the service from the central position to the edge so that they're closer to the devices so that the latency becomes smaller. So we're actually, again, distributing out all that infrastructure that we centralized in the cloud is now becoming distributed again with, with that much more difficulty in securing API. So everything is going to an API and we will have to secure all those endpoints at some point. So it will create a problem on top of a problem. So people are still moving into that digitalization, becoming aware of what needs to be done for that centralization. As we will see now use cases more, take that apart again and move to the edge. And, and there they will have, we will need more security platforms, better security platforms to support that in the future. Awesome. Well, um, uh, thank you very much. I'm kind of conscious of, of time that we've uh, we've run a little bit over, so um, uh, appreciate uh, everybody staying on. Um, so uh, hopefully that's been interesting for everybody. A, a huge thank you to our to our, our speakers. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you, Rob. Uh, really interesting um, for everybody. Um, we will be. Uh, this session was recorded. We will be sending links out. We will be able to share. I'm just going to add a, a quick uh, poll up at the end. Uh, a final one in terms of if there's uh, any more information that anybody would like. Uh, previous ones are anonymous.
so obviously this way if you could complete it, if you want to get any more information from any of our uh, any of our, our speakers, any from our, our guest vendors on today, we'll be happy to get in touch. Uh, we will contact you for a, a copy of uh, uh, Jeff's book, so we can get that get that sent out. So that'll be essential essential reading. I know lots of people had a one thing that they had to do at least during lockdown was uh, get more into reading. So there we go. We're just encouraging that to people to step away from their their screens as well and do some proper reading, even if it is just reading about more screens, and more <laughs> it, technology back again. Um, in the it's other an ebook, so, right? Uh, no, physical. Uh, it's no, a no, physical. physical. Oh, okay. Physical printed <laughs> copy. Um, so, <laughs> absolutely. So, um, I'll just let that uh, just let that finish off. But obviously, um, you've got all of our contact details. So, if anybody wants any more information at the end, please feel get in uh, get in touch with us. Yep. Once again, thank you to every all of our speakers. Much appreciated. Uh, and uh, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you for your time and interest. And uh, have a nice day. Thanks very much. Cheerio. Bye. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.